friends, I apologize for the slight delay and uh, we'll straight away start with the proceedings. India has emerged as one of the fastest growing economy in the world. Our population, almost 65% of that is under age 35. We are the second most populous market, a country endowed with natural resources, almost 10 out of 12 or 13 seasons. We are a technology powerhouse built on the foundations of liberal democracy, civic nationalism, and socialist economy. On the other hand, we have jobless growth for quite a few years now. Bad monsoons in last few years, shaky exports, banks rancid with NPAs, stagnating industrial production, government interest burden, almost equal to the corporation tax that it collects, and the Reserve Bank having a divergent view on growth, inflation, interest rates, so we can see that the challenges are many. A finance minister in India would want to start and fuel two virtuous cycles through any budget. One would be to have moderate inflation, low interest rates and higher investments. And the second cycle would be demand generation, which will put money in the hands of the people, which could be used to spend. This budget seems to be an attempt in that direction and aims to deal with interconnected challenges that our nation faces. For example, nearly 13 lakh crores of projects are stuck up for various reasons, and if they are unlocked, it could result in lower NPAs, create more jobs, and therefore create demand. Faced with more and more non-plan expenses such as one rank, one pension scheme, the pay commission recommendation, mounting interest, and the FM still wanting to keep the fiscal deficit under 3.5% of GDP in spite of the Asmani and Sultani headwinds, the challenges are still many. In this backdrop, what is the best that an FM could have done on the direct tax proposal side? Well, Mr. Jetley has presented one of the longest set of direct tax changes in recent times, apparently more than 100 changes in this budget proposal. This evening, we are here to understand the nuances and implications of those direct tax proposals. Just like each year after the budget, we look forward and we look forward very eagerly to this particular evening. For many of us, the understanding of the tax proposals is incomplete until we hear Dastur Sahib's views. And I say this not as the president of Bombay Chartered Accountants Society alone, but I believe that I can say this on behalf of each one of you, that what a pleasure it has been to have Dastur Sahib speak to us year after year on this topic. <laughs> Mr. Dastur needs no introduction, and I literally mean it, because each one of us is here for that one reason, and that is the speaker of the evening. In today's connected world with so much information, so much knowledge pounding on us, what we look for is wisdom. And that is the reason why this lecture has remained a bright spot in the words of the finance minister for all those who wish to draw from the tremendous experience of one of the finest tax expert, an amazing professional, and an exemplary human being. Ladies and gentlemen, hold on. This is Mr. Dastu's 28th lecture, and I can only say on behalf of all of you that we are so very grateful to have you with us this evening. As a mark of our appreciation and regard, I'll request Vice President Chetan to present a memento. And as I request him to deliver this lecture on the Finance Bill 2016, I request all of you to give him a very thundering round of applause. Uh, 
Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, we are late this evening in starting our meeting because I am not an income tax officer. I made an underestimate of the time I would take to reach this place. As an income tax officer, I would always have made overestimates of things. <laughs> so the fault is mine. And if I may pose a question before I start my speech, Mr. President, do I have to evaluate this and return it as a part of my income under Section 28.4 as a benefit arising from a profession? Uh, please don't tell my income tax officer. The finance bill has 238 clauses and 15 schedules spread over 12 chapters and 212 pages. The income tax content is 112 clauses spread over 43 pages. Chapters 8 to 10 comprise of special provisions regarding direct tax dispute resolution scheme, amendments to the Finance Act, Money Laundering Act, and provisions for settlement of disputants. To conclude the statistical part, research reveals that though in the Income Tax Act, the sections are numbered 1 to 298, 44 have been omitted, and 400 and 476 sections have been inserted from time to time with English alphabets. Some of the alphabets going into four, A, A, B, P, etc. So the ultimate conclusion is that if you take into account the provisions of the finance bill 2016 also, the total number of sections will be 730. And speaking of the alphabets, this really shows the versatility of the English language, that you can pad up the sections in this particular manner. Now, coming to the amendments made, the first one I would like to refer to is an amendment regarding charitable trusts. It is provided that if the registration under Section 12 AA is cancelled, or if the objects are changed so as not to conform to the registered conditions, or if it is merged with another trust not having similar objects, or the trust has come to an end and the assets have not been disposed of, then in that case, the excess of fair market value of the total assets over the liabilities computed as prescribed becomes taxable as what they call accreted income. Now, the rub, it very good, of course, obviously, if you become non-charitable, some consequence has to flow, there's no doubt. But even if the registration is canceled, this consequence will flow, and the consequence is that you have to pay, the trust would have to pay within 14 days of cancellation, the amount of tax on the accreted income calculated at 30%. Now, today, you are aware, cancellation of registrations is rampant because the proviso was added in section 215 saying that if you're for a general public utility and you have a business, 
then you will not be entitled to exemption. Commissioners have gone on to cancel all these registrations. And the consequence is that within 14 days, you have to pay up the amount. Now that cancellation may be set aside on appeal. But the law as it framed does not say that after the cancellation has been affirmed in appellate authorities, you have to pay up the tax, but you have to pay up the tax within 14 days of the cancellation. Now, obviously, this is wholly impractical. And there has to be some provision put in that mere cancellation would not attract the obligation to pay up the tax on the accreted income. One more thing. The liability to pay up this amount is on the trust, on the trustee, and on the principal officer of the trust. So I do not know whether this will be interpreted as meaning that they can take steps personally against the trustee to recover the amount, or personally against the principal officer to recover the amount. It is not only a liability of the trustee as trustee, also provided that if you sell the asset to a person, that person will also be liable for this payment. With the result that if you want to go to sell the asset in order to pay up the tax, the purchaser will, the prospective purchaser will probably say, I don't want to do it because I may be visited with a horrendous tax liability. So therefore, undoubtedly true that you should protect the interest where a trust goes out of being charitable, but there must be specific safeguards. Take this case. Even if you transfer the asset to another trust, which has objects which are not similar to yours, slightly different, the same consequences will flow. So even though the assets will continue to feed a charitable purpose, still the consequences enunciated herein will flow. Therefore, this is one provision, I think, where one has to consider whether an amendment should be made so as to safeguard the interest. Then there is a series of amendments to do away with profit-based incentives. For example, Section 10 AA, 32, 35, 35 AC, etc. And all these are to be done away with by the assessment year 2017-18. Uh, sorry, 2020-21. And if it is a provision which gives you a benefit starting from a particular year, then that sunset provision for that section will be from 1-4-2017. So if you get an exemption for five years starting from the date of production, by 1-4-2017, you have to do it. Otherwise, you will not get this exemption. Now, the phasing out of these incentives, the finance minister said, and the finance minister was the same person who is today the finance minister, that this will be compensated by lowering the rate of tax on companies. Now, what is the lowering of the rate of tax? It is that lowering the rate of tax on companies, not all companies, companies with turnover not exceeding five crores in the financial year 2014-15, and what is the reduction? From 30% to 29%. So that the incentive provisions are all wiped out and the rate of tax is reduced by 1%, not for all companies again, but only companies which have a turnover less than a certain limit, that is 5 crores of rupees. At the same time, though incentives have been, are to be done away with, certain other incentives have been provided, for example, 54 GB where if you sell a residential house, you can get the incentive if you invest in a company which fulfills certain obligations. So the 
Doing away of incentives is, does not mean that further incentives would not be provided. And that is how it should be. Because there is an ongoing debate as to whether you can have provisions in the Income Tax Act for the purpose of promotion of industry or promotion of economic interests. I th one view is Income Tax Act should be on a tax of income. You are not concerned with economic development. That is a function of something else. But I think considering how we are placed in this country, perhaps that is not the best alternative. Then, again, an incentive is provided for new startups. What is the incentive? That a deduction of the profits and gains will be allowed for three consecutive assessment years out of five years from the date of incorporation of the company. Now, which startup company will make a profit for three out of the five years after the incorporation of the company? So once you incorporate the company, time will be taken in setting up the business. So how many years will you be able really to avail of this benefit? I think again, to say that three years out of the first five years is purely illusory. And the total turnover of the business is not to exceed in any of the five years if the deduction is claimed. Now supposing the turnover goes over 25 crores in the fifth year and you have been fortunate enough to claim the deduction in the second, third, and fourth years, where the turnover was less. But the turnover has gone up over the prescribed limit in the fifth year. What will be the position? Will he reopen the assessment to withdraw the deduction already given in the first three years? Again, it is to be, it is, uh, to be noted that these startups are defined in a particular way. And to determine whether it is a startup or not will obviously be require determination of whether this condition is fulfilled. Now, an example of a beneficial provision being turned on its head. Now let us consider there are certain provisions which are regarded as beneficial, but which could be used by the department to foist liability on the SSC instead of really being used as a beneficial provision. Take one instance, section 32 AC, subsection 1A, provides for a deduction where a new, new startup company, where in the case of a company, you have installed plant and machinery of a certain value. Now the plant and machinery as worded today has to be acquired and installed in the same year. Now obviously, if you acquire plant and machinery in February, you cannot install it by 31st March. Now it is provided that Yes, if you acquire in an earlier year and you install it by 31st March 2017, you will get the deduction. Now, the officer may rely on this provision to say, because earlier the argument would be, this is impossible, this is a provision which could never have been contemplated by the legislature. So the condition of acquire and install must be read, acquired in such a year and installed before this particular date. But that argument will not be available because now the amendment accepts that the condition is acquisition and installation. Another example where a beneficial provision can be used to foist a tax liability is very important and that is in 115 JB. Explanation 4 has been inserted to provide that a foreign company will not be subjected to the provisions of section 115 JB if that foreign company 
does not have a permanent establishment in India or it is not required to be registered under any act. Now this proceeds on the assumption that a foreign company is in the first place liable to tax under 115 JB, the minimum alternative tax. But if you see section 115 JB, it says it requires a company to prepare its profit and loss account as per the Companies Act, Section 211, and to lay it before the annual general meeting of the company. Now, a foreign company will obviously not have any annual general meeting as contemplated in the Companies Act in India. So, per se, 115 JB is not to apply and cannot apply in the case of a foreign company. Now, giving an exemption from the application of 115 JB, the officer will say, the conditions are prescribed for exemption. You have not fulfilled these conditions. So you are liable to 115 JB tax. Whereas, in the first place, 115 JB is not at all applicable. Now, this is on the basis of the report of the AP Shah committee, which committee seems to have lost sight, even though brought to their notice, that 115 JB can never apply to a foreign company. So in giving an exemption, you are, in other words, giving an opportunity to the officer to foist liability under 115 JB on a foreign company. Again, under section 47, Clause 13b, it is provided that if there is a conversion of a, com of a company into a limited liability partnership, then if certain conditions are fulfilled, there will be no charge of capital gains tax because it will not be regarded as a transfer. One of the conditions is that the turnover of the company should not exceed 60 lakhs in three years. Now, another condition has been imposed, that the book value of the assets should not exceed five crores. So it may be very difficult for a company, which is to be converted into a limited liability partnership, to fulfill these conditions. And if they don't fulfill this condition, officer will say there is a transfer and a capital gains tax liability arises. But the question is, is there at all a transfer when there is such conversion? As you are aware, the Bombay High Court has taken the view in the case of Texpin 263 ITR 345 that when a partnership firm is converted into a limited liability company under Part 9 of the Companies Act, there is no transfer, but it is merely the company, the firm assumes a different form of a corporate entity, but there is no transfer between two people. So on the same footing, one could say that when under the Limited Liability Partnership Act, company is converted into a limited liability partnership, there is no transfer at all in law. But now that an exception is provided, that you fulfill these conditions and you will not be charged, it will not be treated as a transfer, the officer will say obviously there is a transfer because why else is an exception provided? This would of course be wholly contrary to the decision of the Supreme Court in the case of Madurai Mills, where they held that because there is an exception provided does not mean that in the absence of such an exception, tax would be payable. In that case, it was initially provided that when there is a dissolution of a firm, it will not be give rise to a capital gain. This was when capital gain was initially introduced 
in 1946. When, after the capital gains was abolished in 48 and reintroduced in 56, this exception was not there. So the revenue took the view, there is no longer this exception, so tax is payable. But the Supreme Court held, no tax is not payable because there is no transfer. And if there is no transfer merely because an exception is removed, you can't impose a tax. But this means that officer will probably take this view and you'll have to be litigated. So before you provide an exemption, one must take into account whether it is necessary to, or at least say for the removal of doubts. So that it is not an absolute exemption, but only put in to remove doubts. If you don't have that language, then we are going to have a protracted litigation on this. Section 115QA provides for distributed income on buyback. It is regarded on buyback. There is a distribution of income. And up till now, it was stated that if there is a buyback under Section 77, capital A, of the Companies Act 1956. Now it is stated that this will apply whether the buyback is under 77A or otherwise. The otherwise would be where you have an arrangement, you have a scheme under which a buyback is to be made. It will not be under 77A, but that also will be covered Previously, the argument was available. It is not under 77A, and therefore, there is no liability in respect of the buyback. Section 50C, Section 50C provided that if there is a transfer of land or building, or land and building, then it will not, then for the, and for the purposes of stamp duty, the value is taken at higher than the declared consideration. It is the declared consideration which will be regarded as the transfer price for the purposes of determining capital gains. Now, this was, uh, now it is pro uh, provided, I'm sorry, this was provided in 43 CA and now for, for capital gain also this is provided under section 50. It was previously provided under 43 CA, now extended to section 50. Section 50 is brought in line with 43 CA. The exception is where there is evidence that the transfer, that you will take the stamp duty, the, the value, as on the date of the agreement and not on the date of conveyance, because agreement may be in year one. Conveyance may be, which will get registered in year eight. If you are to take the value as in the date of conveyance, obviously there will be a huge difference between the stated consideration and the consideration which has been uh, as per the stamp duty. Because obviously if it has gone up in seven years, the higher value will be there for stamp duty. The question is, where there is such an increase, you will take the value as at the date of the agreement for determining what should be the proper value and provided payment has been made by an account payee check prior to the date of the agreement. So therefore, if the account payee, one must have evidence, not when the check was drawn, but when it was handed over to the recipient because it depends on the account payee check being received by the other party. So now one would have to provide some evidence, keep some evidence as to when this account payee check was handed over. One thing which of some importance is that if one draws a check after the date of the agreement, but with a date prior to the date of the agreement, what will happen? 
Now, as they don't honor checks which are drawn more than uh, six months earlier, this window is only open for an adjustment for six months and nothing more. But so one would, uh, it would be advisable to keep evidence as to when you handed over the check. Section 115BF has inserted clause 52, which provides for a 10% tax on royalty income derived by an Indian resident who is a patentee and where the patent is developed and registered in India. Developed and registered. Now, the explanation says that developed means as expenditure incurred by the SSC for any invention in respect of that patent. But how can developed at all mean the expenditure which you have incurred. Obviously, there is something wrong in saying develop means this. And one is perhaps reminded of Lewis Carroll's looking through the glass, where they say, Humpty Dumpty says, the word will mean what I say it means. So, Develop now means expenditure incurred. It is also provided that expenditure will not be allowed in respect of the development of this patent. Now what does this mean? Expenditure will be incurred in development of the patent in year one, two, and three and you will claim deduction on the basis that it is expenditure on research and th section 35 applies. The patent will come into being in year four or five. So how will you disallow the expenditure incurred in the earlier years? Its section seems to contemplate that this will be, expenditure will not be allowed. But what I feel is, that what they really want to say is that on the royalty income, you will pay tax on the gross royalty. Instead of saying that, they have said no expenditure will be allowed as if the expenditure is to be actually disallowed, which has been incurred. Now, this is again something which will have to be looked into. Now, presumptive tax is provided for in section 44 AB where a person carrying on a business a certain percentage of the turnover will be regarded as his income. Subsection 4 is now inserted that if in any of the five succeeding assessment years the SSE does not declare income as per the presumptive methodology he will not be entitled to claim deduction thereafter under the presumptive tax. Question would arise, because to claim presumptive tax, your income must not exceed, your turnover must not exceed the sp specified limit, which was four rupees one crore, now proposed to be increased to rupees two crores. So in year one, two, and three, you claim presumptive tax methodology. In year four, your turnover exceeds the prescribed limit, so you don't get it. Will it mean that for the next five years, you cannot get the presumptive tax methodology applied? I would think it is only if you are still within turnover limit, but for some reason you decide, I don't want the presumptive tax. Because for example, in year four, you have incurred a loss and you would rather get the set off of the loss. So you don't opt for the presumptive tax. In that case, you cannot opt for presumptive tax, even if your turnover is below the limit in the next five years. But not because you have actually crossed the limit and it is not your action. It is not your decision. 
to take advantage of the presumptive tax methodology, but you are out of that section. Though as it is worded, it may even be extended by the department to say, you're, you have not gone under in year four under presumptive tax, so you cannot now claim it for the next five years. I don't think that would be right, but this is certainly a possibility. Then section 44DA has been inserted. It enables a resident who is engaged in a, prof it, it provides that, sorry, a resident who is engaged in a profession but he enters into a non-compete agreement, then that amount would be regarded as his income chargeable to tax. The question is, would it be charged as revenue income or as a capital gain? The memorandum explaining the provisions of the Finance Act suggests that if the amount to be received by the professional is in spread over five years or 10 years, not installments, but he, it, supposing it is said that business, the profession, he has transferred the right to carry on the profession to A and he is to receive 3% of the turnover of A for a period of 10 years. The memorandum would appear to suggest that this will be assessed as revenue income. If he was to receive a lump sum of two crores of rupees, it will be subjected to capital gain. Now this is a clarification regarding the assessment in the hands of a professional. But as you are aware, in section 28, there is an identical provision for a person who is engaged in business. And one may be able to apply the same logic that if one receives a payment, a pers person who is a businessman receives a payment and that payment is spread over a period of years, it should be revenue income. If there is a lump sum payment, it should be a capital gain. So therefore now the professional is put on the same footing as the uh, businessman, which perhaps is not wrong because professions now seem to be conducted as a business. Section 143.1 has now been amended to provide that in making an intimation, the officer has wider powers than before. And all that is stated is that before, for example, if in the audit report it is stated that this expenditure has not deductible, but the says he takes a different view and claims a deduction, the officer can add back that amount, even in an intimation. It is provided that he will communicate to the SSE his intention to do so and he will consider the reply and make an assessment. Now the point about this is that how do you know he has really considered it or not considered it? Because there is no reaction, there is no contact with the officer. It is somebody in Bangalore who will do this. Who will be Miss Nirmala or Mr. Ramesh? You do not know the person. There is no way of interacting with that person. So whether your reply is at all looked into, one doesn't know. And you must have come across cases where a commissioner issues a notice for revision under 263. You file a reply on 15th January of 25 pages. The commissioner passes his order on 16th January. Now how do you, obviously he is not considered, but there is no way if there is merely not even any personal contact to establish that this is an addition made without any consideration of what you have said. 
There may be various reasons why you have not claimed, you have claimed that expenditure, but there would be no way of defending it by obtaining a feedback of what that person says. If there is a personal assessment, you appear, you put forward your arguments, he says something which you can meet. But here is a case where he sends you a notice, you reply, you have no chance to disabuse his mind from what he thinks of your reply. So it is very all very fine that yes, we will have this electronic processing of your returns and this is what it will be, it will make it quicker. But my own old fashioned view is that this really deprives you of a very important weapon at your disposal to appear and try to disabuse the mind of the officer from what he proposes to do. The important thing here is, as you must have felt in practice, that you file a return, tax is deducted at source. But in this magical form, 26 AS, that entry doesn't appear. So he tells you, this TDS, I will not give you credit. Now, you have filed a profit and loss account or an income and expenditure account in which it is specifically recorded in your computation of income also that the turnover of so much includes TDS of let us say five crores of rupees. He will take your turnover at five crores, determine your profit on that footing, but when it comes to giving credit for tax deducted, he will not give you credit for 50 lakhs of rupees because it doesn't appear in that form. If you tell the officer, please give me this credit, he will say you reconcile with form 26. Now how does the SSE reconcile with form 26 AS? How does he know what exactly the person who has filed the form, what exactly, which amount he has taken into account? You may have five dealings with XYZ company. What, which particular item have they taken into account, not taken into account? Now, you will find that when they had initially introduced this position, it was provided that if Form 26 AS is used, a copy of that form will be furnished to you if you ask. But today, if you ask for Form 26 AS, he will not give it to you. Again, giving you the Form 26 AS means you learn of what that particular person has deducted from everybody. So therefore, here again, to demand tax, where tax has been deducted at source, certainly is contrary to what the memorandum of explaining the provisions of the Finance Act says, namely at page 31, it says, promotion of culture of compliance. Now, would you like to comply with a provision where you will find that tax has been deducted and yet you will be asked again to pay that tax? Must you bill? some confidence in the SSE that he will receive a fair and proper treatment. Now, all this asking you to pay the tax without giving credit is clearly contrary to section 205, which says that where tax is deductible at source and has been deducted, the SSE will not be called upon to pay the tax. But yet today, he takes your, your, in your computation you have said rupees 5 crores tax deducted at source, 
He takes it as a part of your income, but still calls upon you to pay the tax because he doesn't give you that credit. And this has been upheld not only by the Gujarat High Court, the Assam High Court, and the Karnataka High Court, but by the Bombay High Court in Yashpal Sani versus Rekha Hajarnavis, 293 ITR 539, where they say that if tax is deducted, the assessee will not be called upon to pay that tax. Now, should not the finance minister issue strict instructions to his officers to comply with the provisions of the act in these rudimentary things? As I say, I don't know about what you feel, but I feel it's extremely frustrating for an SSE not to get this credit. Now, why does he not get it credit? If you are a professional and you keep your accounts on the cash basis, you will return that income in the year in which you get the payment. But that Form 26 AS will be on a mercantile basis. You have sent a bill in year 910 or whatever it is, 1516. You get payment in the year 1718. You will return it in 1718. And you will claim credit because you can claim credit in the year in which you offer the income. But that Form 26 AS will have it in 1516. How do you know where he has returned it? So my earnest appeal to would be that it is these things which have to be sorted out to create confidence. Because as a professional person, you may often find the SSE asking you, should I do this or I should not do it? And I don't know whether a weak professional person may think that why should I ask him to comply with the law if there is going to be some injustice done to him in the ultimate analysis. So to infuse confidence, all these irritating matters should be sorted out. And you will find even the commissioner of income tax would not respond to this complaint that you make. Now, unless Unless you tone up your administration, this will not be possible. It is very good to say, we have this electronic things done, therefore you don't have to visit the a tax office. But supposing I want to visit the tax office, what do I do? Must it be, must it not be, must it not be that an SSE should have an option of stating I don't want electronic processing. Please issue the notice to me and I will attend. Must that be there or not? Now, notices are sent electronically and you are supposed to respond to them. As I understand it, if you don't have an email, they won't accept your return if there is no reference to an email number. Again, must it not be that I should have the option to say, I don't want email communication. Or it is really foisted on the SSE. I don't mind if they say, no email communication, you are not regarded as an SSE. Very well, I'll be very happy. <laughs> but must you have that option or you must not have that option? Because if your return is not accepted, you have to give some number of someone else. And that someone else may not communicate to you. And then Miss Nirmala in Bangalore will say, I sent it on such and such day. I've received no reply. So I pr pr proceed to make the assessment. Therefore, I feel these are matters which require to be ironed out and sorted out. Then we have an interesting provision an amendment in section 244A, which provides for payment of interest. The normal rule is interest will be from the first day of the assessment year. But it is provided that if you file your return, 
beyond the due date, the interest will run from the date of filing the return. Now, advance tax has been paid in the previous year. You have the money. On the first day of April, you have that money. But if I've delayed in filing my return, you will not pay me interest on this excess payment made. At the same time, if I've delayed in filing my return, you will charge interest. So you will charge interest for delayed filing, but you will not pay me interest on the excess payment from the first day of the assessment year, even though you have the money. So, and this is, what is the reason? To encourage compliance. But you've got a provision that interest will be charged for late payment. That is sufficient deterrent for compliance. Why have this further provision that you will not get interest even when you paid an excess amount? Then again, it is stated that this is very interesting. The memorandum says at page 33, in the interest of fairness and equity, it is provided that interest on refund on self-assessment tax will be from the date of payment of the tax. But what is in the interest of fairness and equity? You are delaying the date of payment of the interest. So where is the question of fairness and equity? But perhaps justified, because there is so little fairness and equity about the whole thing, that they want to say, yes, yes, this is fairness and equity, when there is nothing like fairness and equity at all. So if you honor that principle, there must be fairness and equity. I think the entire system requires an overhaul. And the finance minister would do well to apply his mind to these small things. Because you will have a perfect system if you look after the trifles, because you make all these trifling matters. You will have perfection if you look after trifles. And as someone said, perfection is no trifle. So therefore, there has to be an application of mind in this behalf. One of the most controversial, uh, well, yes, there's a now provision for penalty. Section 271, which provides for penalty, is omitted. But that doesn't mean there is no penalty because 270 capital A has been introduced. What is, with, now, what is concealment of income or what is furnishing of inaccurate particulars as per section 271.1c is now fairly determined by decisions on the point. But now under 270A, penalty is levied for underreporting of income and misreporting of income. Misreporting of income is also defined. Underreporting of income is also defined. So now a litigation will start on what is misreporting and what is underreporting? Things had been reasonably settled, but now this whole controversy will arise again. I do appreciate the lawyer finance minister's desire that if there is more litigation, the profession will benefit. <laughs> but Sh one should also think of one's responsibility as an Indian citizen. So when something is reasonably settled, why have the whole thing again? This was the very basis on which the new Direct Taxes Amendment Act, which was there, was regarded as something which substituted language where things were settled. And that meant, because there is always the inventive mind in a professional's person, just as there is a very inventive mind in an income tax officer. So where things are settled, I personally feel there should be no interference with this. Now, 
how the penalty is to be worked out, the memorandum at page 35 gives a complicated working of how this is, what is underreporting, how you determine underreporting. It also works how the penalty is to, to be determined is also illustrated at pages 36 to 37 of the memorandum. I personally find the whole illustrations very difficult of understanding. Perhaps it might have been better if there was a chartered accountant finance minister because he might have put it more simply. But the working out of this penalty, and one more thing, today the penalty is 100% to 300%. Now what is provided is there will be a fixed penalty in certain circumstances of 50% and in certain circumstances of 200%. Now, A has defaulted and B has defaulted. Is there no difference in the extent of the default? So must you not have this leeway of a penalty between 100 and 300%? 300%? So even if you've committed a default, if it is something understandable, something which could be explained, you may say, yes, there is a default, I'll levy minimum penalty. Now you have no op option. Just consider in our criminal jurisprudence, person is guilty, he may be sentenced to imprisonment ranging from six months to three years. The judge or magistrate will decide, is this something which is not as per the law, but something which could be understood and therefore minimum imprisonment, assuming imprisonment is to be imposed. But now with a fixed, again it is stated that this is to reduce the discretion of the officer and to provide for a fixed penalty. But does it mean that one has no faith in the income tax officer because we don't want him to have any discretion? So surely there should be a minimum penalty and a maximum provided so that depending on the extent of the default, the penalty may be levied. Now I come to a provision which is of great controversy. 1150, as you are aware, provides for dividend distribution tax. Now what is provided is that there will be dividend distribution tax and in addition, any dividend over rupees 10 lakhs will be subjected to tax in the hands of the recipient. And that rate is prescribed at about 11%, because 10% and then surcharge, etc., etc. And the history is somewhat interesting. The tax was introduced for the first time from 1st June 1997. And it was provided that the DDT will be 10% without surcharge. This was increased by the Finance Act 2000 to 22%. Again, reduced by the next year to 10.2%. So obviously it was found that 20% dividend distribution tax is too much. For one year it was discontinued as you are aware, 2002 to 2003. Reintroduced in 2003, and the applicable rate was 12.8, which was enhanced by the 2007 Act to almost 17%. And the Finance Act 2014 made it 20%, and 2015 Finance Act made it into 20.5%. Now in addition to this DDT, which is now 20%, a little more than 20%, the recipient of the dividend will also have to pay tax. Further, expenditure incurred on earning the dividend is now disallowed. And you must have noticed in some cases, the officer magically 
very often works out the extent of what is the expenditure or earning the dividend at much more than what the dividend is earned. So if you take the position that let us have the position prevailing in June 1997 before this was introduced, there would be no DDT, there would be no disallowance of expenditure because 14A was introduced much later. And perhaps if you work it out, the tax liability would be lesser than what it is now with DDT and disallowance under 14A and the tax now introduced on dividend income in excess of 10 lakhs. So just work out the position in June 1997, what it would have been if you had that law and what the position today is. And please note, this does not take into account the tax paid by the company on its own income. Because what is dividend? Company has paid tax on its income. It distributes it to the persons who are entitled to it. They again pay tax on it. To some extent, one may say, perhaps not strictly within double taxation, but yes, a double taxation on the income of the company, which has already been taxed when it comes into the hands of the shareholder. And if you find that under the June 1997 disposition, I would have been better off, then certainly this is a matter which requires serious reconsideration. My very efficient juniors have worked out this, but I'm afraid because of the Copyright Act, I cannot share the illustration with you. Then, now we come to certain chapters which have been inserted in the finance bill. One is chapter eight, dealing with what is called equalization levy. This is based on the recommendation of the OECD committee on BEPS. As per clause 162, where a non-resident receives from a resident who is carrying on a business or profession or from a non-resident having a permanent establishment in India, a sum for rendering any specified service, an equalization levy, levy will be payable at 6% of such consideration. So if the resident pays to the non-resident for the specified service, he will have 6% on that amount will, have, will become payable as an equalization levy. Now the officer will find it difficult to locate that non-resident. So the obligation is on the person paying the amount to pay this 6%. If he doesn't pay it, he, has, he can deduct it from the payment to the non-resident. If he doesn't do that, he has to pay it personally. Specified service is defined as online advertisement and any other service which may be notified. The problem lies here because tomorrow, or not tomorrow, perhaps in the next budget, they may specify various other services. For example, you want an opinion on English law or American law. So you approach a barrister or a solicitor in the UK to give his opinion. He will be a non-resident. He's rendering to you a specified service. So you will have to deduct from his payment 6%. The non-resident may say, if you want to deduct, I will jack up my fee to that extent. Because why should I have this liability on me? Because I will not get credit for this equalization levy. Why will he not get credit? Because clause 50 in section 10 now introduced says that this will not be included in his total income, the non the equalization levy. So if it is not included in his total income, it will not be a part of his income. If it is not a part of his income, he cannot say that there is double taxation on my income. So he may get no credit for it and yet, it will be the responsibility of the resident availing of this service, unless that non-resident has a permanent establishment in India, to bear this 6% levy. 
if it was intended that there should be this levy, then perhaps it may have been better to introduce it as an income tax, because then at least the non-residents may, may have been able to claim credit for it. This is one more example where you are trying to give some advantage by saying it will not be a part of his total income, but in the ultimate analysis, it goes against the interest of the SSE as such. Of course, this liability arises only if the payment in a previous year exceeds 1%, uh, exceeds 1 lakh of rupees. If the amount is not paid within this prescribed time, uh, again, interest will be payable at the rate of 1% per month. Then they have introduced income declaration scheme. They have the Black Money Act, which is in respect of income or assets arising from undeclared income, which are outside India. This scheme deals with two types of income. One is what is called a tax area, and another which is called specified income. Specified income is income which arises on account of a legislation or account of tax liability which arises because of retrospective legislation. So that is regarded as specified tax. Tax arrear is an amount which is payable by the SSE on the assessment made, nothing to do with voluntary disclosure of income. But if he has not paid that tax when it was earned, he can, if an appeal is pending before the commissioner, it is only if the appeal is pending before the commissioner, whereas in respect of specified tax, which is in respect of income arising from a retrospective legislation, it can be an appeal pending at, before any authority or before the court. But for availing of tax area declaration, it must be an appeal pending before the Commissioner of Income Tax. Now, the provision is that you will pay tax on the declared income at 30%. Plus, you will pay tax at 7.5% because 25% of the uh, tax payable, which is called the Krishi Kalyan Sess, and which is referred to as a surcharge on the income declared, and also a pa penalty of a similar amount, that is again 7.5%. So the total amount which you would have to pay for settling this litigation is 45%. And the pending appeal, you will have to withdraw. So therefore, the serious question which would arise is, if I have a reasonable case for arguing in appeal, should I at all go in for this settlement? Because settlement means automatically I will pay 45%. Now, it may be that even if I lose in the appeal, it may not be a penalty matter because a different view is taken. Though, of course, now, under the new provision where they say misreporting or underreporting, what will be the consequences, something which will have to be worked out. But what the point which I'm trying to make is that a person may be slow to avail of this because he has to surrender whatever is done in the assessment he has to pay interest and he has to pay, in addition, penalty. Now, the odd situation is this. If you don't pay the tax and the interest and the penalty, then the declaration made by you will be treated as if it is not made, which would mean Forget the declaration. But the law says that on the foot, that if a notice is issued for filing a return and we don't include this amount, he can proceed to make a reassessment. So he would issue the notice on the basis of the declaration as made 
obviously, because otherwise he has no information. Yet, you will regard that the declaration is not having been made. Declaration not made, but the law permits you to rely on it to issue a notice for assessment. Again, if the tax is not paid, it is provided that it will be, the declaration will be void. Now, if a declaration is void, again, you cannot have a look at it. But the law provides that you can still have a regard to it, even though it is supposed to be non-existent, even though it is declared to be void. One can only say that it illustrates the frustrating feeling that heads you win and tails I lose. Because you have not paid the tax within a certain period of time, your declaration will be regarded as non-existent, but steps still taken to recover tax on the basis of the declaration. Further, there is an interesting point. Section 190, the proposed clause 194.2, which is to be inserted, says that where no tax, surcharge, and penalty has been paid, it will mean that the declaration is non-existent. Please note the word, no tax, surcharge, and penalty. But supposing you have paid 10% of the tax, will your case come within 194.2? It is not a case where no tax has been paid, but you have not paid the full tax. So again here, if they want it to be effective, they have to provide where the full tax penalty has not been paid and not where no tax surcharge or penalty has been paid. The interesting point here is that the Benami Prohibition Act, is re which provides for the transferee to be regarded as the owner, and which provides for prosecution of the person who has entered into a Binami transaction is not to apply if the Binami Dar transfers back to the real owner or was the, who was the real owner the property he has obtained. Now, the question may arise, when he does this, Will the officer say that you have transferred back this asset, therefore 56.27 applies because you have transferred back the asset without receiving any consideration. And therefore this is income of the transferee. I would think no, because the Binami Prohibition Act is not to apply. And if it is not to apply, that person is not to be regarded as the real order. So he's only giving back something to A which belongs to A. But nevertheless, there is a possibility that if the Binami transfers back the property to the real owner, there may be a question raised on the applicability of the of section 5627A. Uh, then there is also a parallel between the Black Money Act and in this act, some similar provisions are there, but under the Black Money Act, the amount which is to be paid would be nearly 90% of the undisclosed foreign income, whereas under this, it is pegged at 45. So therefore, one would say that insofar as Indian undisclosed income is concerned, it is treated with kid gloves in a way compared to what it would be if it was a foreign amount. Then there is, as we have said, the dispute uh, resolution where we have already stated you paid the specified tax and you paid the tax accrued on the income and what is the consequence. Finally, I would like to refer to just two things. Section 2, it, it, the clause uh, 2, 23b, propose, uh, D, proposes to insert by clause 3 that 
communication of data and documents through electronic mode will be regarded as a hearing. Now, how can you regard communication of something through an electronic mode as a hearing? This is of determining whether he has actually applied his mind to you. And you will be conscious that if you get a notice under 142.1 or under 143.2, the first thing he will write is, please file your return of income in a physical form. Now a notice is to be issued under 142 or 143, if on looking at the matter, the officer feels that he requires further information. But if he doesn't have your return, which is probably lying in electronic mode in Bangalore, how does he issue the notice? Is the issue of the notice at all valid in these circumstances, where it is clear that he doesn't have the return when he issued the notice? A matter which perhaps will have to be taken up if an adventurous SSC takes up the point. Circular letter dated 9-10-15, issued by the CBDT, makes it clear that you must, officer must take your consent before he chooses to test certain propositions and by making you a sort of guinea pig that will you give me your reaction. Now, would not it mean, as I said earlier, that even if he otherwise wants to issue a notice in electronic form or he wants me to comply electronically, he should take my consent. One matter I may refer to, the memorandum in explaining why 10% tax is levied where you have dividend income in excess of 10 lakhs, says at page four that the dividend distribution tax is 15%. And therefore, if further tax is to be levied. But the dividend distribution tax is 20%. The memorandum calls it 15% to justify the further levy of tax on dividend. Is that a misreporting or is that an underreporting? <laughs> and should a penalty be charged on the person who prepared the memorandum? One question which would arise is if this bill is to receive some sort of a title, what would you call it? A suggestion, just a suggestion is that this is a rationalizing bill because it provides for rationalization of provident fund, pension fund and national pension scheme. It says rationalization of time limits for making an assessment and recomputation. It speaks of rationalization of time limit for making assessments in search cases. It speaks of rationalization of provisions relating to the income tax appellate tribunal. It speaks of rationalization of tax deducted at source. And lastly, it refers to rationalization in respect of section 50C. Rationalization, yes, but are the provisions or do they have any rationale or rationality is a matter for you to decide. Thank you. Uh, friends, before I request Sunil to propose a very hearty vote of thanks, uh, I want to thank you all for your patient listening and thank the speaker for such clear, succinct and meticulous perspective on the tax proposals. I'll need only two minutes. I'll request uh, participants to please be seated for two minutes.
The first announcement is about the lecture meeting on indirect tax proposals, uh, proposals from the budget to be held by Mr. Uh, Vikram Nankani, senior advocate. This will be held on the 10th of March 2016 at the IMC. Friends, BCS jointly with the Chamber of Tax Consultants is organizing the third youth RRC at Igatpuri from 17th to the 19th of April. This is especially targeted at young professionals up to the age of 40 years and the first two editions have been an extremely successful events with a lot of opportunities for networking. The theme for this year is chosen to be the Startup India theme and I would request you all to look at uh, the announcements in the newsletter and subscribe or, uh, to the event if you feel it's appropriate. Uh, friends, uh, over the last few days, BCS has also undertaken a new initiative of recording short videos prior to the budget on the budget expectations and even now on the views of the budget by various experts from various strata of the uh, professionals. This, uh, these videos are uploaded on the YouTube channel. I would request you all to kindly go through those videos and uh, share your comments on that. Uh, they are small snippets of wisdom. Uh, the YouTube channel also has various lecture meetings including the current lecture meeting which was live uh, streamed across various people. And uh, I would like request you all to be more active on the social media because BCS also recognizes social media as one uh, platform through which the distances are uh, narrowed. Uh, with that, uh, I conclude my announcements. Now I would uh, go to the pleasant task of proposing a very well-deserved uh, vote of thanks uh, to the speaker, uh, Sri Dastur Sahib. As I speak before, uh, as I stand before him to present uh, thanks, there are various thoughts which uh, float in my mind. Sir, should I thank you for accepting our invitation very readily, year after year? It's a 28th year and we are indeed indebted to you for accepting our invitation very warmly every year. Sir, should I thank you for sparing your valuable time out of your extremely busy schedule uh, spanning across your professional life and you know taking the time out from that to address a gathering of all of us or should I thank you for the masterly analysis which we have all witnessed over the last one and a half hours. Sir, your analysis was full of wit and wisdom. It was a perfect reflection of the deep experience which you have gathered over more than five decades of your professional practice. Sir, your eye for detail and perfection was more than visible in each and every sentence which you spoke over the last one and a half hours. Sir, I have no doubts in my mind that any amount of words to thank you would really be insufficient. For a fatherly personality of your teacher, I would feel some English words will not be sufficient. And therefore, I would not venture into really proposing a vote of thanks. But I would request all the participants to, and on behalf of all the participants, I would request a vote of respect by way of a standing ovation and a thunderous round of applause. Thank you, sir, for everything. Thank you.